everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Kobe, and I'm Assistant Professor of Practice in Notion and Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Center for Coastal Physical Oceanography and OD Resilience Collaborative Seminar. Um, and we were, we we're very happy to have Dr. John Cook with us here today. We've had a wonderful, day, spend, wonderful time spending the day with, with John today. He is a research assistant professor at the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University. He's been here in the United States for about three weeks, so he's brand new uh, to us, but he founded the Skeptical Science um, uh, website, uh, which I know many of you are familiar with and have been using to try to combat some of those um, questions that you may get in class or uh, people that you may encounter that are skeptical or are denying uh, science. Um, and the, that has won a number of prizes. He's also written a college textbook and some other books, including Climate Change Science, a Modern Synthesis, um, and Climate Change Denial, Heads in the Sand. Um, and, and he's done a lot of uh, analysis of climate denial and climate myths, and he's also taught uh, MOOC, those massive online courses with over 25,000 enrollments. So who wants a class with 25,000 students? <laughs> at once. At once, at once. So welcome, John. Thank you. So oh, thanks very much first for the invitation to talk. Um, it's really great to be at Old Dominion University, and you guys have been great hosts for the last couple of days. And also, I appreciate the, the weather that Virginia Beach has um, <laughs> delivered. So, like, I came from I came from a subtropical zone, and, and I've been really worried about just how cold the winters would be here. And it turns out there was nothing to worry about. So, <laughs> so that's next year. <laughs> so, um, I I research the psychology of misinformation. That's what my focus has been. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is over the last year or so, misinformation has been rebranded and they now call it alternative facts. Uh, in fact, just over the last week, I noticed that they've even abbreviated it to alt facts, <laughs> which is kind of taking this quite a damaging um, phenomenon and giving it kind of a trendy hipster title. So, um, <laughs> in fact, it, could, it would... It could only be more Orwellian if they started calling it unfacts. Um, hopefully not. So, so misinformation is, has been a growing thing, and it hasn't just been the last year. It's been around for, for probably forever. And uh, in fact, a, a couple of years ago, this was 2014, the World Economic Forum uh, listed the top 10 trends that, that they were concerned about. And one of them uh, we see is online misinformation was one of the global trends. And when you look at the, some of the big things on this list, to have online misinformation as, as one of the top 10 global trends is, is quite concerning. And last year, the Oxford Dictionary, who nominate a word of the year every year, nominated post-truth uh, as... Now, I'm, I'm a bit confused because that's two words, but um, they're the Oxford Dictionary. They should know. They have the best words, so they um, are the authority. One thing that disturbs me about this picture is that it's such a cheery, um, bright-looking thing when they're describing something that's kind of causing the crumbling of democracy, but, but it gets people's attention, I guess. So, um, so, so misinformation is, is a big problem, and, and particularly over the last couple of years with social media causing misinformation to, to be able to spread around the world um, at, at a startling pace. And here's a quote that really reflects that about how quickly misinformation can spread. But this quote is not talking about Twitter or Facebook or social media. It actually it came actually from Winston Churchill Church. in, in the early, <laughs> the early 20th, 20th century. So I think that if he saw how quickly misinformation could spread by Twitter these days, it would, it would make his head spin. Um, so misinformation, just its existence, is a problem. But it can especially be a problem when people are motivated to believe misinformation. Now, these lines are referring to a psychology study uh, done a number of years ago. Uh, I think it was in the 50s. Uh, and what they did was they, they had participants in an experiment 
um, look at these lines and, and predict uh, or, and try to just say which line was, was longer than I look, compare the lengths of different lines. And it was a really simple thing. It was just like lines that were obviously different lengths. Uh, the big trick in this experiment was everyone in the room who was, who was comparing these line lengths were in on the experiment apart from one person who was the actual only <laughs> participant in the experiment. And everyone else deliberately gave the wrong answer. And what they found was when everyone in the room was giving the wrong answer, the actual participant in the experiment started giving the wrong answer as well. And, and what this tells us is that people can believe obviously wrong false information, uh, even when it's staring them in the face. Um, people can believe things that they don't want to believe, even when <laughs> what we see with our own eyes is contradicts what we want to believe. <laughs> so let's talk about climate change and what, what motivates people to not believe in climate change or to not accept climate science. Now, this graph is a summary of a study done by some, some scientists at the University of Queensland, where I just came from. What they did was a meta-analysis. They, they did a survey of all the different surveys into uh, people's attitudes about climate change. And they found that there was a whole range of different things that, that influence people's climate beliefs. But the number one thing that drives our attitudes towards climate change and climate science isn't, isn't our education levels, it isn't our income, our age, our gender, it's our political affiliation. Now, that's the number one thing by far compared to, to everything else. And what that tells us is that humans are social animals. We're tribal. We belong to social groups. And we're heavily influenced by, by the groups, um, the group that we, have, that we socially identify with. Um, so let me give you an example of, of that in action. In my own research, I run experiments where I, ask, I have these surveys and I ask people um, various questions about climate change. One question I asked them was, between 0 to 100, what percentage of climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming? And what I found, uh, this, is, this is a result, uh, and I also asked people questions about their political beliefs. So, so along the horizontal axis in this graph, we see as people go to the left, they're more left-wing. As they go to the right, they're more right-wing. So it's, it's liberal to conservative. And as you uh, go more conservative, people gave a lower number for the scientific consensus on climate change. The average answer was about 60%. They thought, people thought it was 60% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming. But um, liberals thought it was higher, conservatives thought it was lower. Now, the actual answer, it, coming from a number of studies who've tried to, that have tried to measure the scientific consensus, have found that there's around 97% agreement amongst climate scientists that humans are causing global warming. So there's this huge gap between the... Um, the actual 97% consensus and what the public think is scientific agreement. Now, so there's two things that, or three things that are really driving this, this gap. The first thing is that cultural bias, uh, that influence of political ideology or political affiliation. So, so we, as, as we pointed out, as, as people become more conservative, they're less accepting of the scientific consensus or less believing that a consensus exists. But even for people right at the far end of the liberal um, spectrum, uh, there's still a big gap there between what they think the consensus is and the actual 97%. And so what that tells us is, as well as this cultural bias, there still is an information deficit. Some people aren't even aware of the high level of the scientific agreement. Or there's a misinformation surplus that, that people have been misinformed about the, uh, the consensus. And so this is what I've been really interested in, this, this misinformation uh, influence. So there's a, there was an experiment run by George Mason University where they tried to address this uh, gap, this consensus gap. And what they did was they divided their experiments in their, in the participants in their experiment into four different groups. Now, in one group, they just told them about the 97% consensus. They just informed them that there was overwhelming agreement amongst climate scientists, and they measured before and after 
the, what they thought the consensus was, just to see whether there was any change in belief. Now, this is a message that has got out there a bit uh, amongst the general public. We've had the Prime Minister... Does anyone in this room know who this... Uh, I've, already, I've got it down the bottom. <laughs> just, I was curious. But this is the Prime Minister of... The former Prime Minister of, of England. Um, this was at the COP21 conference. So there was almost every world leader uh, was un, under the same roof in this building. And he talked about the 97% consensus. Uh, this was President Obama... Um, uh, talking about, he, and he's tweeted it a, a couple of times as well, talking about the 97% consensus. And, and what this study found was encouraging. They found that when you tell people about the consensus, the perceived consensus does go up. We saw this big gap. The gap closes when you, when you tell people what the actual uh, level of agreement is. So that's good. It goes up by about 20%. The problem is that's not the only messages that people receive. And we have people who, who argue that there isn't a consensus, that they argue that the, the, the 97% number isn't real, that it's, that it's discredited or that it's bogus. Here's an example of, a, um, of Senator Cruz arguing that. And so in the second group in this experiment, the researchers tested what happens when they're just exposed to misinformation. Now, this is the misinformation that they used. It was text taken directly off a website called the Global Warming Petition Project. And this website basically argues that there's no consensus because 31,000 scientists or people with a science degree have signed this petition. And the petition basically argues that, that there's no evidence that humans are disrupting climate. Now, what happened when people were exposed to just this misinformation? Oh, oh, hang on a second, I've got my sides out of order. So, um, but going back one, so this Global Warming Petition Project, like it's just a website, uh, I don't know, ha ha hands up anyone in this room who's actually been to that site and seen it. Okay. What's the website? Uh, it's the, I probably shouldn't even, it's the Global Warming, <laughs> it's the Glo Global Warming Petition Project, I think it's petitionproject.org. Um, but... Last year, there was an analysis of social media articles about climate change, and this was the number one most shared article about climate change on Facebook. And it basically argues the petition project argument that, uh, that over 30,000 scientists um, dissent, disagree with the, the consensus on climate change. And so, so this website, which was founded uh, over a decade ago, is still being being used. So what they found in their psychology study, the researchers at George Mason and at Yale and Princeton, was that when people are exposed to just misinformation, it reduces their perceived consensus. It, it, uh, it went down by about 10%. Uh, and so misinformation does work. It does lower people's acceptance of climate change, um, uh, perceived consensus, uh, support for climate policy. Uh, misinformation does have an effect. And when we talk about the danger of misinformation, usually this is the effect that we're talking about. But what I'm going to show you next is, I think, uh, evidence that shows that there's an even more insidious influence of, of misinformation and alternative facts. And understanding that, I think, is the key to understanding how to respond to alternative facts and misinformation. So people don't see just the facts and they don't see just alternative facts. What people are bombarded with is, is both, conflicting pieces of information. And here's an example. Of, there's a, a, on Bill Maher's show, there's an interview with Rick Santorum. I don't know if you recognise the back of his head there. <laughs> but um, they got into a back-and-forth argument over whether there's a consensus or not. And, and this is typically how people... Um, receive information. This is often how the media portray climate change and other issues, just present both sides of the issue. And in this experiment, this psychology experiment, they tested what happens when people are exposed to conflicting pieces of information. And this is the result, the third column in this graph. Now normally when you publish a scientific study and you get a non-significant result, it's not very interesting. It's, it's often not even publishable. But this is one of those cases where a non-significant result, um, which you can't really distinguish from zero, 
is actually highly significant because what this tells us is that when people are exposed to facts and alternative facts, they often cancel each other out. Uh, and this has big consequences for anyone who's involved in science and science communication and just communication to the public. Because even if you get your communication perfect and you, you um, fine-tune it, you do the research, you do market research and you get every word and comma perfect, that can be cancelled out by misinformation. And so this, this tells us that um, it's important to get our science communication right. We need to be evidence-based and, and, um, and work hard at making sure that we're communicating science well or that we're educating well. But we also need to be aware that facts alone are, are necessary, but they're insufficient. They're not enough. That facts can be can be cancelled out by alternative facts. It's a bit like um, one of those episodes in the old Star Trek um, show when you have like Captain Kirk and then an evil clone of Captain Kirk. And how do you tell which is real? How do you tell which is the real one and which is the evil one? And, and, and alternative facts does that. How do you know which is the real fact and which is the falsehood? When people can't tell the difference, they disengage. They just decide, uh, I, can't, I don't know which is, which is real and which isn't, so I'm not going to make an opinion. Like I'm not going to... Um, I'm just going to stop believing in facts. And, and that's really the unequal playing field with alternative facts, is that it's not about necessarily convincing people to believe in the alternative facts. All you have to do is convince people not to believe in the facts. And by having that conflict, people, um, people often do that, as, as my data shows. So, so what is the solution? Um, what we need to do is provide a tiebreaker. We need to help people resolve that conflict between facts and alternative facts. And so what they tried in this experiment was a fourth, with the fourth group, what they did was they gave them a warning before showing them the misinformation. And in this warning, what they did was they explained the techniques that the, um, the petition project did to distort the facts. And there was a number of things. A lot of the 31,000 scientists, well, not a lot, some of the 31,000 scientists weren't even real people. Um, 31,000 sounds like a lot, but in terms of people who have science degrees, it's a tiny percentage. And the most important thing uh, is that 99.9% .9 of the 31,000 people weren't climate scientists. They didn't have expertise in climate science. And what they found then was when you warned people about the misinformation, basically when they um, inoculated them against the misinformation, then they found that the misinformation was, was mostly neutralised. So people saw the fact, they explained the techniques of the misinformation, and then they were shown the misinformation, and they were able to resolve the conflict. They could see how the misinformation distorted the facts. They could resolve the conflict, and the facts worked. So um, the funny thing was, at the time that they were doing this research over at George Mason University. I was over at the University of Queensland on the east coast of Australia um, in my little cubicle working away on my own research project. And I was doing um, almost the exact same experiment, not even knowing that, that this research was going on. Um, I thought I was sort of discovering something new and exciting and, and, and found out that actually these other people done it just before I did and, and found the same result. But what, there was some interesting differences between my approach and theirs, though, which I think offers even more insights. Coincidentally, I was using the exact same misinformation. I, was, I, was, I took the petition project um, information and I showed that to people by itself. And just like in the other research, I found that it did lower people's perceived consensus. So I got a 10% decrease, exactly the same. Uh, and this, this shows the change in perceived consensus across political ideology. And the interesting thing is that the misinformation had no effect on liberals, but it had a big effect on conservatives. And so conservatives went down by 20%, liberals 0%. The overall effect was it went down by about 10%. So that tells us that 
misinformation about climate change has a disproportionate effect on people um, who, are, who are more conservative, who are more predisposed to believe that misinformation. Now, for the next, for another group in my uh, study, I, I also showed them an inoculation message. I, I explained the technique that the misinformation used. But there was a big difference between how I did it and how the, the George Mason University researchers designed their experiment. I just explained the technique uh, in very general sense. I didn't mention the petition project at all. All I talked about was the technique of fake experts, of, of using people who have this impression of expertise. Um, they, you know, those are, uh, the tobacco industry perfected this in the 1970s. They had a, a strategy called the White Coat Project, where they took people, put them in white coats, and, um, and said... Um, the expert, 10,000 experts agree that, that, um, that smoking is, soothes the throat or is good for your health or, or whatever. And so what I did in my inoculating message was I talked about the tobacco uh, strategy, uh, I talked about the technique of fake experts, and, and, but without actually using the, the referencing that specific piece of misinformation, which I then showed them. And what I found was just showing them, like I didn't talk about the 97% consensus at all, but just talking about um, the technique of the misinformation and then showing them the misinformation completely neutralised it. The blue line um, is, was the change in perceived consensus and it was basically zero. It was statistically insignificant. Uh, so again, it's a case where a null result is, was actually what you were looking for. You were looking to neutralise the misinformation. And so, so we have these two separate studies trying to deal with misinformation and finding that the key is uh, it's not just the facts because facts and alternative facts cancel each other out. You need to present the facts, but then you need to explain the techniques used to distort those facts. Uh, you're, you're trying to take your facts, and before you send them out in the world, you're kind of wrapping them up in a, a protective layer so they're not going to um, get uh, damaged or wiped out by the misinformation. So the techniques of misinformation, the techniques of denial, there's a, there's a great paper by Deard Helm and McKee. Did I write the reference? I didn't. All right. So um, I think if you Google the five characteristics of science denial, you'll probably find it. Um, they look at a whole range of different movements uh, that have denied a scientific consensus, whether it's um, smoking causing cancer, um, den denying the scientific consensus on evolution or on climate change, and they find that all these different movements share the same five characteristics. They rely on fake experts, which is the technique that I, I was just talking about. They use logical fallacies to come to false conclusions. They... Um, they demand impossible expectations, like de demand impossible standards of proof from scientists. They cherry-pick the data and they resort to conspiracy theories. If we have time, I'm happy to give examples uh, further on, but I'll, I'll move on quickly. Um, and, and I use the acronym FLIC. It's a really easy way to remember it. And, uh, it's, it's, and I use pretty pictures because I like, I like doing... Uh, using visuals to help people remember stuff. And, and this has been a really useful framework for, for looking at misinformation and um, identifying what techniques they use in order to, to neutralise them. So when I, I've been looking at uh, surveying the psychological research in the misinformation and demarking, and, and, and if you pull it all together, it, this really points at the, the ideal structure for responding to misinformation. And there's really two key elements. It's, the most important thing is still the facts. We do need to explain the facts. And we need to make the facts as compelling and as sticky and simple as possible. Ideally, even stickier than the myth that we're trying to dislodge. But as well as the facts, we also need to explain the fallacy that the misinformation uses. And it's, it's that the fact and the fallacy together is what uh, inoculates people against misinformation. Now, I find that this structure is, is really versatile, and I've used it in a number of different ways. When conservative newspapers attack my research, uh, and I'll, I'll request a right of reply, and then I'll, if they say yes, sometimes, 
uh, I'll, I'll write an article that, that uses this structure. If they're attacking a 97% consensus, I'll, I'll go into how robust uh, all the different studies that have found 97% consensus and then explain the techniques used to cast doubt on it. Uh, I've also uh, developed a massive open online course uh, about climate science denial. And what this, this MOOC does is it, go, it tells the story of climate change. So over six weeks, we go through explaining how the, all the um, basic elements of climate science, that it's happening, what's causing it, um, the impacts of climate change. But we do this in a series of short seven-minute videos. And every video communicates a key fact about climate change, but also addresses a myth associated with that, that fact and then the technique that the myth uses. So, so we have a, a long table of every lecture, the fact and then the myth associated with it and then what fallacy that myth uses as a way of summarising the, the 50 most common arguments about climate science and what the facts actually tell us. Um, and, and even a week ago I gave an interview on the Hearsay um, program, which is a radio program local to this area, and somebody um, uh, called in and, uh, and argued that uh, something about the temperature data being suspect. And, and so while they're asking the question, it, it's one thing to, to write articles and write lectures using the fact myth fallacy, and we, we have the time to edit and think about it. Uh, it's not something you can easily do necessarily when you... Um, on the fly, like you're in a conversation, you're having having um, a family dinner with a cranky uncle, or you're or you're on a radio show and someone throws a, an argument at you. But what I tried to do was, like on the fly, I was trying to think, all right, how can I respond? What's the key fact um, to respond to with with this myth? And the key fact was when it attacks on the temperature record. The key fact is that a number of teams across the world have all built their own independent temperature record and they all replicate. They all find exactly the same response. And when when you get independent replication, that's when you can have confidence that our scientific understanding is is robust, it's accurate. Uh, and then I think, uh, hopefully, I, have to, I haven't listened back to the episode yet. There's a podcast of it that I'm going to try and download. But um, uh, then I, I, I think that I explained the technique used to cast out on the temperature record. Um, you look up that podcast and, and maybe you can confirm whether I'm representing it accurately or not. Now, last thing. Um, my, my job, there's two really key things that I do in my, in my job at George Mason University. One is researching how to communicate better, researching how to do science communication. But the other thing is communicate that research. Um, so I, it's... I guess one of my missions, one of the things I'm really passionate about is communicating to anyone who's interested in climate change and, and, or science in general, anyone who's, who does science communication, whether they're scientists or educators or, or um, activists or um, just yeah, people who have conversations about climate change with their friends and family or on social media. It's, it's imperative, it's, it's really important that we listen to the science of science communication, that we, um, that we take an evidence-based approach to how we talk about evidence. And so, so one of the things we're doing at George Mason, uh, uh, hopefully over the, sometime in March, is we're going to uh, launch a podcast where we talk about the evidence on talking about evidence. So talk, talk about the social science research into science communication. So, um, so if, you, if you're interested in that topic, then I recommend you go to the website evidencesquared.com. That's the name of our... We're trying to be clever there. Evidence Squared is evidence about evidence. It's a very nerdy podcast title, but we kind of like it. And um, you can subscribe on the website so you can get notified as soon as we, uh, we start um, publishing episodes. And it will just be going through all the different aspects of science communication, what the research tells us, and, and look at, I guess, the issues of the day. There's a lot of interesting things happening at the moment. And there's March, there's a lot of interesting things going on. We've got a March for Science on the 22nd of April. 
we've got a, a climate march on April 29th, I think. So certainly lots of, um, lots of interesting topics. So, um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to talk about, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. That was really nice, um, but I'm sitting here listening to this and I'm thinking, one thing that you didn't factor into your model is any measure of perceived cost and benefits to the receiver of this information based on the outcome of models. And I think that's got to play a major role in this because if, if I'm simply an objective observer trying to distinguish between two facts that have that, are, that, that might be interesting but have no bearing on my life, I can afford to be objective about it. But if I'm an out-of-work coal miner in Appalachia who's worried about the fact that my kids are all going to be dying from drug overdoses because there are no jobs for them, I've got short-term concerns and issues that might outweigh whatever factoids or information or contact you're going to, you're going to impose upon me, especially if what you're telling me, this is a, something that I have to be worried about at the end of the century. So how, where does that fit into all of this process as well? Because it seems to me that's a big part of the problem. And, you know, it, 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 can, it, it gets back to the tragedy of the commons argument that, that's, always, that, that's at the heart of all of this. With, at what point is the benefit to larger society, at what point does that, that outweigh the personal benefit that accrues to me from doing the, the facts? And you can see that through the smoking example and this and a variety of other things, even down to the, you know, the... the uh, uh, the uh, uh, inoculations, the uh, uh, controversy today, it all has to do with benefit, uh, benefit, cost and benefits to the individual. How does that, how do you mm -hmm. talk about how that factors into this? So there's a cliche that, that scientists put in every paper, right, which is more research is required. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, like, really what, what we've done here is establish general psychological principles and, and, a, and a broad roadmap, but there are so many different ways that, um, that that can be applied in different situations and just the conversations I've been having over the last two days have been talking about the, the, the local situation here where you have flooding and then you have, have politicians who have all these different um, tug of wars pulling at them about, about you know, tax income and ideology and impacts and health and, and there's there's a lot of things going on there, and it's um, what I'm talking about here is really, really at a cognitive level. It's 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 much broader. I think that what you also need to do is uh, take take these kind of experiment designs and apply them to specific situations, um, and then I think you'll start to answer those questions. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the vaccination story might be really a, a good case study because when I was a kid, everybody got polio vaccine polio threat was perceived as real and you know who cares how, how much potential damage the polio vaccine might cause you the threat of polio vastly outweighed that everybody got polio vaccine today right. it's just the opposite now the concern is polio is not such a big deal and so people are not having their kids vaccinated because the fear of the secondary effects of the vaccine outweighs the potential threat from the primary disease and if I can go back couple of slides um, talking about like the most important um, thing when you're debunking misinformation is really identify well if you're looking at a specific myth what what you want to do is dislodge that myth with the facts and the fact to dislodge a myth properly needs to really be even more compelling than the myth which is hard because often myths are really simple and facts are quite complicated nuanced and uh, so this is the challenge for communicators, and, and there's no easy answer here, but communicators need to work really hard at telling compelling stories, like taking the facts and telling stories that communicate those facts accurately. They're, they're, um, they stick to like, an accurate um, depiction of, of reality, but also they have to um, be compelling. And so like vaccination, I think that... Uh, 
mm. like a, a possible way, and there have been a number of studies looking at how to debunk myths about vaccination, and sometimes they backfire if they're not done well, and they can actually, for people who are anti-vaxxers, it can harden their attitudes and, and make them even more, or even more less likely to vaccinate their children. Uh, I'm not, I don't know what the answer is there, but I imagine that telling the story of what, what vaccine, like just like to me, the most compelling thing about vaccination for me personally is it's, it's one of the, um, like most, uh, impressive accomplishments of, of modern science is that we've, um, managed to abolish diseases, really horrible diseases. So I think that telling the dual story of what an amazing achievement it is and also what we are now avoided. Like people, polio is, is so far in the past that people don't realise just how, how bad that was. Um, so making that story as, as compelling and sticky as possible is, is I think, a key to, to countering the misinformation. I yes. I find it quite interesting, though, as far as under uh, social marketing today, so social marketing would suggest that you have to identify where people are, almost like a market, like a, like a product you're trying to sell, it's a question of whether they're able to hear and you don't sell it the same way, depending on, on uh, who it is you're trying to deliver the message to. And so that makes a big difference, too, as, as far as readiness to hear something and they were not all at the same spot, you don't know it's complaining about the same thing. And so the social market, there needs to be a whole other group out here doing research with regard to the marketing based on social marketing, readiness to hear a particular message and, and change the messages upon who they're targeting. And I mean, I agree with you, but I think that that message that we need to do more um, social marketing and, and, and really look at science communication from a marketing perspective is something that a lot of physical scientists are quite uncomfortable with because it's, it's like taking science and trying to use PR to promote it and, and it seems underhanded. Also. But, but, it's, but we're talking about trying to communicate, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. What, I mean, that's what social marketing is, the definition. And so, so my perspective is that we need to be... Like, science is about evidence, but science communication should also be evidence-based. Um, we should be just as scientific in how we communicate yeah. as, as how we do our science. But there's a science to communication, too. That's right. right? <laughs> That's my point. Uh, and for more on that, check out our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and so, to me, it's, it's not about... Like, marketing kind of comes across as this sort of PR thing, but really, it's about what, what uh, does social science research tell us are... Well, firstly, what, what are our, understand our audience, understand what are effective ways to communicate our science, our facts, in ways that resonate with that audience. It's pointless to talk at our science in our science language if that's not the language that our audience speaks to. We're being counterintuitive. And if we're truly evidence-based and recognise that and, and communicate our science in ways that are relevant to our audience. Sometimes we're all more skinny in the sense that we may have to fight with we're all trained not to talk about cause and effect, right? In the climate context? Yeah, in science in general, we don't talk about cause, we talk about correlations and... Right, well, it depends on the, this. Well, I mean, the, the work I do, like there's, in the psychological the research, there's, there's different ways of approaching it. Like there's the surveys, which are correlational. They'll say, well, people who... Um, reject climate science also happen to be very strong supporters of free unregulated markets as a correlation. So that's, that's correlational. But then you can also do randomised experiments where you divide people randomly into different groups and then you apply a stimuli and uh, different stimuli to different groups and that helps you tease out cause and effect. Like, like a medical study where you give medicine to one group and you give placebo to another group and if there's a difference then you can establish that that medicine causes an effect. So, so yeah, the, uh, like it's, it's really about the, the scientific method used. Uh, yeah? Thank you. I, I, um, you talk about um, psychology and sociology and also uh, climate. Um, can you tell us um, what your background is 
Okay, so my background is uh, I originally uh, studied physics. Um, physics. So I, I come from a physical science background. Uh, and then after I finished university, then I um, did, uh, I guess, communication from a like I, I got involved in in um, in writing and okay. and cartooning and illustration and design. So. Uh, and then after that, I um, got back into science communication, which led me towards social science. And so I've kind of had this sort of a melting pot of physical science, social science, and practical communication. And this is, which is partly why I love doing these pictures yeah. and, and <laughs> things. So, um, and so the funny thing is, uh, at the Centre for Climate Change Communication, they, ha they have this wonderful model of science communication uh, based on the work of Baruch Bischoff, who says that the, the, an effective way to do science communication is to have a team that brings together content experts like climate scientists or physical scientists, social scientists who can provide an evidence-based way to, to take that content, and um, communication practitioners, people who are out there on, in the trenches and the front line who are out there engaging with the public. And by taking those three different groups, um, it, it really builds a robust, effective way of, of engaging audiences. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, this information uh, it morphs very quickly. It, uh, it changes faster than sometimes you can respond to it. For instance, the 97% uh, uh, issue that was up there that you saw the senator and Bill Moore arguing about um, the latest version of that that I'm hearing is, oh, we don't disagree. Yes, mm, yeah, yeah. Ninety-seven percent of scientists do. You know, I agree that you know there's anthropogenic in, you know, effects, but it's just the argument is really that it's insignificant. It's, it's not much compared to nature. So now we're now we have to fight that battle. Yeah, that's and that's so, completely right. And it just it, it just continues to roll and morph and change. And that's really kind of a tactical retreat in a way. It began with there is no 97 percent to, uh, and then once the the 97 message was repeated often by a range of um, different public figures, then it went went to well, I'm part of the 97 percent, so then because uh, it's the 97 percent agree on something that's so meaningless that everyone agrees to, it. and and really what what I guess. Let me try to go. To, let me try to on the fly do a fact myth fallacy of response to that. So the fact is that a number of studies have found that 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing most of global warming. At least 50% of the recent global warming that we've experienced um, is is caused by human activity. And so some studies have have established that most the most um, of, it, of global warming is caused by us. Others haven't been that specific. They've just looked at humans causing global warming in a general sense without quantifying the human contribution, right? Now, this isn't very sticky. It's very complicated. Sorry, I'm, I'm better. And then, and then when we published our study finding 97% consensus in 2013, we looked at the different definitions, whether it was saying most of, most of it's caused by us or just we're causing it in general, uh, and we found that whichever definition you used, we still got the overwhelming consensus. We got up in the high 90s. Um, so, so one argument is saying that, well, I agree that um, humans are causing some of global warming, you know, maybe 1%, maybe just a little fraction. Uh, so that makes me part of the 97%. But it doesn't, because the 97% is, uh, includes people saying that we're causing most of it. The people who are trying to minimise human contribution, we put those in the 3%. Um, and so what that, the fallacy that that argument is doing is it's shifting the goalposts. It's trying to, um, trying to go from um, the node 97 to, well, the 97 definition doesn't mean anything. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably work on that answer a bit more, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, yes? The, the photograph where you showed the, the, the people uh, the polling people that were identified as conservatives as being more sensitive to misinformation. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, this one. Yeah, it was the graph. 
Yeah. Why, why did, did you ever try to figure out why they were more sensitive uh, and more open to misinformation than the people identified as liberal? Right. Well, it's, it's a process called confirmation bias. So when we receive information that agrees with our, um, what we already believe, then we're more likely to think, oh, yeah, that's great information. It's kind of like, have you ever seen people, uh, they start flicking through your music selection and they say, you've got great taste in music. They're actually saying, you've got my taste in music. <laughs> it's that kind of dynamic, right? Um, and the flip side of that is disconfirmation bias. When you receive information that disagrees with your beliefs, you fight against it. You, um, you think of any argument you can come up with to, to discredit that information and, and find flaws in it. And that's why often threatening information actually causes you to strengthen your beliefs, um, even if it's opposite to that information. So most of the people behave that way, is what you're finding, is that if they have a predilection towards uh, uh, conservatism, they're going to like, like what they're hearing. Right. So in, in the case of climate change, like this is not saying that conservatives behave this way yeah. in, in every issue. It's, it says that, and you'll find this in other issues, different groups will react differently. So um, if you receive information that threatens your ideology or your beliefs or your identity or your social identity, then um, you, you will respond like you, you'll fight that information. Or conversely, if you receive information that confirms your beliefs or your identity or your ideology, then you accept that information with welcome arms. Uh, I'd actually continue a question about the same uh, issue. Uh, most of the public uh, do not understand science and they don't know how to read scientific information. So it's obviously it's obvious that they get most of the information from non-scientific sources like news and fake news and other people that think like that. And I wonder if there were studies that tried to correlate between the actual uh, knowledge on, of science for example, maybe liberal people are, in general, more educated because they are more scientific oriented than others. So it could be, so it could be interesting to see if people that are more prone for misinformation, is it just because of their the ideology or because maybe they lack knowledge? And if the latter is correct, maybe we have a hope if we educate our from young age our, our uh, youngster to be more involved in understanding science. So yeah. in the next generation, we have a chance to, to, to get better results. I hate to disappoint you, but <laughs> no, not really. Um, so, I mean, on this graph, education was... Yeah, was but education there. means that maybe all the one on the right side are lawyers and all the one on the left side are scientists. <laughs> right, no, so, um, so there's been a number of... Like, this, this is talking in general terms because it's a meta-analysis of a whole range of studies. But there have been specific studies that have looked at um, different um, measures of literacy, like education or science literacy. And they found that a bigger, a bigger driver of climate attitudes was not science literacy, it was political ideology or political affiliation. And they actually found this really interesting thing was that when people became more educated, um, it actually became more polarised. So if you had, had people who were um, Democrat and their, their climate belief was around here and you had people who, at, a, at an uneducated level, and Democrat, no, hang on, Democrats were up here and Republicans were here at the uneducated level, they found that as Democrats became more educated, their acceptance of climate change went up. Right? So by the time you got to college-educated Democrats, they had a higher acceptance of climate change. So your idea that education is um, the key. right? But they found that with Republicans, as they became more educated, the, the, their acceptance of climate change either it varies across studies, but either stayed flat or it actually went down. So as Republicans became more educated, basically what's happening is they're arming themselves with the tools, the knowledge to argue against climate science and, and strengthen their, their, um, 
their their attitudes uh, in dismissing climate science. Yes, it, it, it's sort of like an under underlying philosophy of life. If you have uh, if you value individual freedom above all else, as opposed to valuing the common good of the society above all else, you're going to be at opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think that's what you're showing. Yeah. I, I, so I used free market support as my um, measure. Uh, there's another. There's other studies that have used like individualism versus communitarianism. So whether you believe like strongly that communities should look after each other as opposed to individuals should look after themselves, and they found that that was that also was a significant driver of climate attitudes. Now, but here's the interesting thing: is what I found that when I explained the techniques of denial. Um, it completely wiped out the effect, especially amongst conservatives. And so what this tells us is that no one on at any point on the political spectrum likes to be misled. Everyone believes that they should be free, uh, they should have the liberty to be free from the influence of misinformation. Uh, and so I think that um, I'm kind of intrigued and optimistic about this result, that perhaps uh, arming people with the tools to see through um, attempts to trick them might be a way to um, to neutralise alternative facts. Uh, yes. Why do you call your website skeptical skeptical science? Right. So skepticism is a good thing. Skepticism is about taking an evidence based approach to how we understand the world. So a genuine scientific skeptic looks at all of the evidence and then comes to a conclusion. Um, Someone who is in denial about climate science has their preconceived conclusion, and then based on that, that's how they, they cherry pick and process the evidence that way. So they'll ignore any evidence they don't like. So skepticism and denial are polar opposites, they're completely different things. So people who deny climate science but brand themselves as um, skeptics, they are giving skepticism a bad name. What I'm trying to do is claim back that word and, and, and restore it to its former glory. Do you find that they visit your website because of the name? I think the word's got out by now. I think. They... <laughs> <laughs> yes? Two brief questions. First, have you considered the role of Fox News in disseminating misinformation about climate science? And the second, in regard to the uh, George Mason project, have you thought about enrolling students in your campaign, students as big users of social media, they would be a powerful force for disseminating the real facts if you were to use them using their Twitter accounts, their Snapchat, Facebook, whatever it is that they're using. Right. So uh, first question, um, what's the role of Fox News? And the role is huge um, because they... Uh, uh, disseminating a great deal of amount of misinformation. Uh, and as, as we see in this red line, misinformation polarises. Uh, and their audience is that conservative group. So that group is, is becoming entrenched in, in um, their rejection of climate science. And, and it, it just further divides society. We're getting more polarised and a bigger difference between either side of the political spectrum. So, so that's quite a damaging influence that they've had. Um, as for like recruiting students, I, I guess what I'm doing at George Mason is is really um, I, I'm at the stage where it's we're still looking at it at a psychological level, like really using the psychological research to work out the the most effective. Like, like the stuff I've just talked about is very broad broad strokes, as we were saying, it's, it's a very general kind of thing. I think taking it to specific, uh, like d conducting further research to get more specific, um, uh, I guess, practical uh, approaches is really the next step. And then once the psychology has pointed out a, like a way to communicate it, then I think it's a case of coupling that with computer science research to, to scale it up, to deploy facts and, and deploy um, inoculations through social media or, or whatever, uh, through mainstream media, through whatever, through messengers who engage directly with the public, through educators. There's, there's 
not just one avenue. I think there's a whole range of ways that we can communicate. Um, and so hopefully this is just a first step in, in developing that, that uh, exploring different ways to communicate the facts and inoculate people against misinformation. Um, so, yeah, I don't think you've asked a question yet. Uh, no, you, yeah, you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just kind of curious whether you're, whether you know the study that looks at the TIMS data. TIMS. TIMS data. It's an uh, international assessment of mathematics and science knowledge for students around the world. It's largely given to the UK state. I'm trying to look here, I said I'm going to misspeak, but I can't find all the data right here. But with regard to back to Tall's question, with regard to the like education would be the answer. But for these countries, it's the, the unit is the country, it's not a person. And so there's a listing of the top 10 to 25. We don't do well in the United States, but we're where we are on this list as to how we score. Um, looking at a correlational study with that and whether that country largely believes or doesn't believe in climate change. I don't know that I've seen that study. So. Yeah, I mean, I've seen um, multinational surveys of climate attitudes. Um, and the general, there's been a few. What's that? Correlated with this performance. This performance yeah. is used a lot to measure education systems around the world. I haven't seen it connected with, with that. It's more, more standalone climate surveys. And what, what they find is that there are really four or five countries that perform badly on the uh, climate literacy or climate acceptance measures. And those are um, Australia, so I, I, we're not doing that good. USA, England, Canada, and New Zealand. Um, so, so, yeah, well, what are the, um, you know... English-speaking. Well, well, English-speaking English and possibly... Murdoch consuming yeah, might Murdoch be, um, <laughs> might, but that's correlation. That's not causation. Yeah. <laughs> it's genetics. Genetics. Well, correlation might be causation. Yes. So, so, have you ever thought about how vulnerable we as trained scientists are to the disinformation problem as well? Yeah, a, a lot actually. Yeah. So, um, so the scientific community is vulnerable in ways that they don't even realise. And um, there's a, my PhD supervisor is a cognitive scientist and, and I've watched him give a talk to a room full of climate scientists where he did this little psychological trick to um, kind of trick them into almost hallucinating that they heard him say something at the start of the talk and just by using assess word associations, um, like he would say words like curtain and frame and glass and then at the end he would say, who heard me say the word window and they'd all put their hand up and and none of them, he never did. Uh, and, and he was just, I think he just liked to mess with <laughs> but, but the principle he was trying to establish is um, we are subject to influences that, that are often subconscious that we don't even realise. And, the, uh, and there's been a lot of research into the, the principle that he terms um, seepage. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's often found in, in a, a number of... Um, areas where we have a group, uh, like, for example, a minority group that is bombarded with attacks, from external attacks, the, the group, it, it changes their behaviour and their attitude without them even realising it. And, and he was saying that this is happening with the scientific community with climate change. Climate scientists are being attacked on Fox News, on in conservative um, newspapers and on blogs, on the internet, emails, um, um, lots of different ways. And that is um, affecting, one, their willingness to engage with climate change with the public, two, how they talk about their results, often minimising their results because they don't want to appear too alarmist, and three, even how they practise science sometimes. There was a, um, a, 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 I guess, a claim, a meme, that, that global warming stopped in 1998 and that, that there was a hiatus. There wasn't any hiatus, but... Um, that that meme got um, perpetuated so much that scientists just published uh, a whole range of papers reinforcing this existence of a non-existent hiatus to, in order to try to explain it. So, uh, yeah, so I think that th th there's, um, there's research coming out um, 
uh, from George Mason now, uh, finding a similar effect with weather casters or TV meteorologists. They've, they've found that um, that they often don't talk about the climate consequences of the uh, like connect the dots between climate change and, and weather events because they're afraid of backlash. And and the big irony is that the weathercasters who do engage have found that there is very little backlash. So there's this disconnect between what they think the backlash will be compared to what the backlash actually is. So I, th I think that that's another example of a, a form of seepage, a form of unconscious um, influence on, on how, how scientists and meteorologists um, behave. So, uh, yeah. When you just listed the countries that are, are scale the worst on uh, understanding this climate situation, it, it just hit me that that's mostly the Judeo-Christian world. Is there a theological basis? <laughs> 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 a theological base versus uh, evidence or scientific on yeah. a horizontal axis? There's a, there's a psychology researcher at Berkeley, Mike Rennie, and he has this idea of <laughs> not talking about the other countries, mostly America, and I think there's a kind of a theological element to his theory. I'm not I'm a little skeptical of it myself. So, I think yeah, that... Um, I think it may be more valid than the, uh, maybe the uh, theological basis. Well, no. I mean, the, the, um, the, a number of surveys have looked at um, different drivers of scientific attitudes, and, and a lot of them have included religiosity in them. Uh, and it's nowhere near as big a, a driver of climate attitudes compared to political ideology. Um, my... my supervisor ran one a really comprehensive study not just looking at climate change but a whole range of attitudes about vaccination and, um, and evolution versus creationism and climate change and other stuff and so those, those graphs would convert would be more closer to each other than uh, if it was a, a theological uh, yeah it, there would still be a slope if we were talking about religiosity going yeah. towards the right um, there is still a slope but it's not as steep not as steep We've got a, Mia has a question from online. Oh, great, yeah. Judy Hinch, a online viewer, asked, are there any good websites to recommend for laypersons? Besides skeptical science? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for laypersons. So uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm having a blank. So anyone else in the room want to throw some suggestions out while I, while I think? So, um, I mean, I mean, there's so much... There's actually so much information Zach out there. Yeah. What's that? Zach Lane is pretty good. Let's talk at Right. Well, the NOAA site is really good as long as it's survived. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in fact, the climate.nasa.gov is a really good website. I've been looking at that recently, mainly because we scraped it just in case it got deleted. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it, it really does a great job of summarizing the climate change like explaining the science and providing all of the data visualising it and explaining it at a really simple level um, even EPA used to have a good page on the climate change yeah. So, so one thing that we do on sceptical science too is, is we do look at all the most common misconceptions about climate change but we try to write our responses at multiple levels, at a basic and intermediate and an advanced level. So it's really a way of reaching multiple audiences. It, it kind of solves that science communication problem of what level do you write at. We just decided to write at all the different levels, which is a lot of work, but it also is quite powerful in terms of... Um, well, it's quite freeing, because rather than agonise, oh, do I lose this term or not, or do I, do I delete this paragraph or not because it's so complicated, oh, we just throw it in the advanced... Then, yes. And we get to get to stress out, like less stressing out because we can we can write quite simply, knowing that people can go up a level if they want to get more information. Do you have links there? Um, yeah. So the other thing we do, and this is really the genesis of the Skeptical Science website, was me collecting peer-reviewed research relevant to all the most common denialist myths. Right. So um, so what we do in the website is link directly to all the, the peer-reviewed papers, uh, ideally ones that are open access or, or PDFs that are, that are online that are free access for people. Now we're kind of, we've been doing this for 10 years and 
some of those links have gone stale, and so we're kind of um, trying to s solve that problem of, of curating the content to make sure that, um, that the links are all working. But we're working on it. Well, thanks everyone uh, for coming, and uh, thanks John for spending almost as much time answering questions as you did in your in your talk. There were some great questions from folks, um, but and I'm sure you're going to be around a little bit now. So if some people have some remaining questions, they want to come up and talk to John. That would be great. But I'll be I'll much. be near the coffee. Um, That's being near the coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks very much.